Hello all. I'm no audiophile, but I do love my vinyl records. Old blues and soul for the most part, if you're interested. Included in my modest hi-fi bits are a pair of Rogers DB101s I bought sometime around 99 or 2000. They're a really game little monitor or bookshelf type speaker with an interesting curved frontage. The aim with these stands then is to first and foremost lift the speakers to my ear height when haunched in a chair. They usually just sat on the floor where it's impossible to get the most out of them. I also want them to incorporate my looping wooden frame design style as well as having a curved forward facing feature that complements the speaker shape. Hopefully a balance of form and function. Now this is a hugely involved build, probably more than the little Rogers deserve to be honest, and it's resulted in my longest video to date. I hope you'll stick with it though, as we glance over many techniques and methods from the usual machining, to a bit of turning, steam bending, tapers, inlay, even a bit of coloured concrete casting. It's become pretty standard for me now, but the first step is always creating a series of templates from CAD drawings. The looping frames I do really can't just be winged on the hoof. Is that a saying? I'm imagining a flying horse that happens to not be a very diligent joiner. Anyway, curvy bits all laid out then. I rough cut with a jigsaw first. Might a saw and table saw next to both dimension and square before shaping starts. As I mentioned and taken close to the line with the bandsaw, the components get routed to the templates. Small and light pieces these, so the router table is out. Instead, I have the templates fixed to my sled, double sided tape to mount the components and then mill with a flush trim bit. This is one of the reasons why the initial dimensioning is important. It gives you true edges to align components to templates. Everything shaped, it's mortise and tenon time. I know a lot of people like to see hand cut mortise and tenon action, but I made this machine to make the process efficient and repeatable. Part of a viable business, even though in this instance, I'm making something for me, not a saleable product. I have numerous videos on this machine, its functions and its progression if anyone's interested. It's a router slayer and copy router, a manual CNC I suppose you could call it. I'm changing here from the tenon to the mortise template. A quick process after the first template was set. At the back of the gantry, you can see the copy pin that follows the templates. Everything milled, 42 mortise and tenon and all, time to start assembly. Despite the angle and curves on these speaker mount pieces, a little block appropriately sized at the bottom makes for easy clamping. With other pieces, using clamping squares and or shims keeps everything behaving well between clamp jaws. Out of the clamps, a little fertile here and there, take off the odd tenth where pieces meet. This gives the router with a round over bit a smooth run around the assembly. Despite all the joining faces being milled flat and square, it's still good practice to utilise clamping squares where you can. In this case keeping the base square to the back legs. This will have adjustable spiked feet on the base, but you don't really want to be fighting twist when you build, which would lead to a wobbly base when complete. When dry, the speaker mount part can be glued to the legs and base. After which, sanding starts. There's an awful lot involved in these looping frames, most of it done by hand. Don't know if you really get a sense of that from my vids, but let's face it, watching any more than a few seconds of someone sanding is like woodworker waterboarding. It is for me anyway. I toyed for ages with how I was going to go about adding some mass to the speaker stands. The frames being solid oak, they have a weight you can feel if you know what I mean, but something extra is needed to manage the energy from the speakers. I did think that casting a sort of concrete pendulum would be cool, suspended from the curved front piece you'll see me make shortly, but I figured it would just add fuss to the what I've come to coin warm minimalism of my designs. 
A floating block in the base it is then, suspended from below on two African blackwood stays, dovetailed into the base. Needless to say, careful measuring of the tail socket is needed to set up for machining tails with a good tight fit. Slightly oversizing is best, then micro adjust to creep up on best fit. That's a satisfyingly snug fit. As a bonus, they also serve as an additional structural component, stiffening the base of the speaker stands. Being somewhat of an afterthought, it proved a bit tricky feathering the blackwood into the base already rounded over. They are unseen of course, but I still patiently whittled away until there was a blend I could live with. As it turns out, all that was the easy part. Next phase is making the curved front piece, the front leg if you will. Each front leg made of two pieces. The lower piece tapering from the bottom to a bulbous middle where it will meet the second curved and tapered top piece. What was I thinking? Little blocks, sticky tape and an odd bit of edge band help to rough out the curve. Then to the bandsaw. As I cut the bottom pieces of the front leg here, you can see a huge crack in this slab. Though not all the way through, it did go end to end and very much limited how I could cut the pieces I needed from the slab. The curves aren't my ideal orientation on the grain, but I really didn't want to buy an extra slab, especially for them, for a personal build. Here then, before I get to cutting the tapers, I'm cutting the tenon in the lower leg that will intersect the base. It needs doing at this stage as, with all the tapers and curvy bits to come, it serves as a datum for 90 degrees to the base. All that gets a bit lost when shaping starts. I bet you're expecting a little bit on the right to go there, eh? Having marked out the tapers on the legs, I need to transfer them to a bit of ply to make a couple of taper sleds for the bandsaw. Bandsaw because once mounted to the ply, the 70mm cup depth on my table saw isn't enough to get through the oak and the ply together, more's the shame. I do mean to make a taper jig for the table saw at some point, but in the meantime, this method works great for the bandsaw. double-sided sticky tape again, this time to fix the taper template to some scrap for a sled. You can see there why I've not done a proper jig for the bandsaw. The table is just too small a material this thick. The fence is barely holding on as it is. These front legs are going to have an inlaid blackwood pinstripe down the centre. Before I do the side tapers, I need to route the housing for the inlay so it's in true centre, for both the straight lower pieces and the curved top. Then back to the bandsaw for the side tapers. If on your piece the taper is the same each side, and assuming the first taper cut was decent, you can use the offcut and the same template or fence setting to cut the other side. The offcut makes up the angle if you catch my drift. Bit nubby at the blade exits, but happy with the shape. All the sculpting to come will deal with the nubbins. Just freehanding the curved pieces. Don't know if it shows very well, but I've used masking tape to give me a path of the taper to follow with the bandsaw. Right, let's make these legs whole with some uh, holes. 
No fancy joinery here, just a couple of 8mm dowels. Before the obligatory clamp up shot, which is an unusual one given the shape of these things, I need to just jump to preparing the blackwood inlays. Need a fairly precise 6mm depth on these for a good snug fit. One of my many continuity mangles for the eagle eyed, but hopefully the chronology makes sense. Voila, chopsticks. So for gluing the front legs together, I like to tap in a piece of inlay at the join. It won't stay there, just until everything's clamped. This keeps the point where the housings meet at the joint perfectly in line. Two clamps either side of the leg gives us something to anchor to. Then, another clamp can pull the other two clamps together, closing the joint. It's odd little things like this, I think, why boat builders are often referred to as their own nation state, where I first learned this trick. All glued fast, a bit of a clean up to see where we're at. There's some fleshy cheeks where I went walk about with the bandsaw, so I mark the high spots, then scrub back to something like even. So blackwood, a kind of ebony replacement. It's hard and extremely dense, but has very little give in it. It'll crack rather than bend for the most part, especially on pieces this small. So to get them to take the curve here, I need to steam bend some of the inlays. The pieces that cross over the join in the front leg only need to bend one end, so I mark from where with tape. I don't really have the need for a full blown steam bender, nor the room here, so for these little pieces I'll use the hot bath then iron technique. I wrap the pieces in some cloth from an old jumper, keeping the bits I've taped separate. Rolled up, they're placed in a tray and covered with boiling water. Like the kettle says, prepared with love people. I keep them in the bath about 10 minutes. You'll know when, as Blackwood releases a lot of oils under heat, it'll start to discolour the water slightly. Interesting smell too, a bit like berries and tobacco. They're then wrapped in foil for a good steaming. Iron turned up to 11, applying heat for about another 10 minutes. This will take longer for larger pieces. This method works best for very small or thin pieces really. Again, the smell is one of the cues. When the escaping steam smells strong with the scent of berries and tobacco, you know you're getting there. For the form, I'm using one of the waist sides from cutting the curved top pieces. This won't give me an exact curve match, but that's not necessary here. I just need enough of a curve to help the inlays take the shape when glued in place. This needs doing pretty quickly, and making sure the pieces are in the right orientation. A bendy ply rip gives me the clamping face. Next day then, unclamped, a nice bunch of gently curving blackwood. Ideal. Time to glue in all the pieces. The fit is good and tight, and once tapped in, is going nowhere. Around the curves though, I did clamp where pieces connected to minimise the risk of any funny business. Spoke shave for the wind to bring down the blackwood inlay. Didn't take much doing despite protruding 2 or 3 mil. Very interesting wood to work, I swear it feels like you're working plastic at times, not that I've ever spoke shaved plastic. Next, the freshly sharpened spoke shave is again used to sculpt the leg. Basically a round over, but graduating. A large round at the centre where it's thickest, then graduating to a very slight round at each end. Now the original mortise I cut in the bottom of the base for the leg was cut in the usual way, 6mm chisel to chop away for a 6mm tenon. But on the dry fits, I decided the leg topped out too close to the bottom of the speaker, not touching, but a couple of mil away. I had a nagging feeling a vibration would surface at some point, so I decided to drop the leg height, which meant tapering the mortises to match the leg bombs. This ended up being fairly stressful and time consuming, so I got on with it and didn't film it. To fix the front leg to the mainframe, I'm going to turn some 12mm through dowels from the blackwood. At the bottom of the front leg especially, this will give a visually satisfying spot at the end of the pinstripe inlay. My sled with its turning accessory is back out again. I mill down to 12.2mm, 
The Fosna bit gives a pretty consistent hole cut of 11.95mm, so a light sand and we should be on for a crisp, tight fitting dowel. Yes, I have my dowel length in the drill chuck. I didn't want to be bashing in 12mm dowel at this stage, too much potential for damage. Spinning them in like this is non-destructive and works a treat. I thought I filmed drilling for the fronts, but obviously not. Still, I should say that I drilled the first part of the hole in the frame, marked the front leg tenon, then drilled a millimetre above the mark for a slight draw bore. Edges of the mortise exposed as they are here. This helps with a crisp meeting of the two parts. I cut them off quite long at first. I was toying with the idea of carving a little detail. In the end, I settled on a very slight dome, like a chocolate button. It's much less fussy. In the back of the Rogers 101 speakers, there are four protruding studs to take a screw fixing. Not in a square, unfortunately, hence the shape of this mount on the frame. A bit of careful measuring, and I did a quick CAD sketch, printed one-to-one -one scale, producing this little template for hole marking. In the base, drilled and countersunk holes for M8 D-type nuts. These will take the spiked feet. The frames then got a final rub down and finish coat. It's bone and mega as per, so the wood maintains that almost untreated look I like so much. On the home stretch now, time to get the functionally crucial concrete cast done. Found these silicone cake moulds pretty much exactly the right size. Bit floppy though, so I knocked up this little ply form for them. A bit of hot glue and a few pins to keep it together. I have sometimes had to get involved with a bit of concrete for work, but avoid it if I can. As such, I wouldn't know a good die from a bad one. I went with what was on the shelf at Wix, which happens to be Bostic. Foolishly, in my haste, I picked up Quickset Ready Mix Concrete. Didn't even realise until I was merrily mixing away and thought, hang on, this is already going off. Thankfully, I got both moulds filled in time, but didn't quite have the time to make the best job of it. Released from the moulds, there's some imperfections. Air holes around the sides. Lives and learns. Still, slabs get sealed. Just a bit of the bone omega I mentioned before. You could easily just use a PVA dilute too. No biggie as it's for indoors only. Just something to stop the dust and crumbly bits from the raw concrete. Spiked feet wound right in. Nice to see the base is flat and stable. Leaves maximum thread available for dodgy floors that way. The concrete slab, weighing approximately four kilos if anyone's interested, will be floating, not fixed. I picked up a bunch of these squishy, vibration absorbing sorbethane pads to sit the concrete on. I like the idea of it adding mass, but isolated. You can see there it really does squirm like it's floating. Cool, isn't it? I'm also using the sorbethane pads for where the back of the speaker meets the mount on the stand. Again, the hope is isolation between the different contacting materials. I drilled holes in the centre. Think of it as a squishy washer. And finally, I can mount the speakers. There's a short gallery of the speakers finished and in situ to follow. I won't blather on over it, so I'll just end here by saying, wow, what a difference it's made. Detail in the sound quality is night and day. A lot of work, but I'm really happy with them. I welcome any comments or thoughts below as always, and if you've made it this far, thanks for watching.